be studying in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter this morning. And I'm going to start with, uh, I believe, verse 8. And let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. Thank you for being so good. Lord, thank you for saving us and delivering us and keeping us by your power. Lord, thank you for the kingdom of God within. It's what's most important. And thank you that your son is coming again to set up his kingdom on earth. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for what you're doing in us. Lord, we open up our heart to revelation. We ask you to speak to us. We will hear your voice. Lord, work in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight by the blood of Jesus. Lord, teach us to listen to the voice of your spirit and keep our hearts soft and pliable before you. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's start reading with verse number 8 in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. It says, By faith Abraham, while he was being called, obeyed to go out into a place which he was about to be receiving as an inheritance. And he went out not troubling in his mind. Now this is Kenneth S. Wiest's expanded translation that I'm reading out. Not troubling his mind as to where he was going. By faith he lived as a foreigner without rights of citizenship in the land of the promise, as in a land not having his own, having settled down to live in tents with Jacob and Isaac, joint heirs with him of the promise. The same one. Now let's just stop right there. You know, I was I was telling the Lord this morning as I was praying and meditating on this section of Scripture. You know, the Bible says they were strangers and pilgrims in a land not their own. And if you haven't realized it yet, as a Christian, you. You don't really belong in the world system. You know, it's, it, you don't identify with their mindset or their thinking, their belief system. You know, you are a stranger. And even though the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth, and even though this is given to you as your inheritance, you haven't received it as yet. It's just a promise. It's a promise of what's to come. And, you know, we have to approach it like that. We, you know, we don't need to think of this world system. I, when I say the world, I'm not talking about the dirt and the rocks and the, the oceans and all that. That belongs to God by right of creation. But the world system and the spiritual world that came into domination through the fall of man is evil. I mean, just look around you. Look around, what, look, look at what's going on around the world in most of the countries. It's not dominated by a force that's good. And even evil is trying to take hold and rule in our own nation now. You know, and you know the book of John, 1 John in the, in the fifth chapter says the whole world lies in darkness. You know, the world system, the world's way of doing things you know, world, world governments are presided over by a dark force. Now, God has instituted civil government, you know, to, to maintain law and order so that there won't be complete and total anarchy like there was before the flood. Because before the flood, the Bible says that, that the, the imagination of men's hearts were only evil continually. And it, and it grieved the Lord. He repented in his heart that he had made man. So God instituted human government, and he presides over it in a sense, and especially as, as the people of God obey him and pray, then it will bring about, you know, angelic intervention in government. As you see in Israel, when they obeyed the Lord, the Lord, he superseded the evil the evil spiritual forces that came against Israel. Same in our nation. The, the spiritual atmosphere in our nation is because of a lack of prayer. 
It's because God's people haven't prayed. It's because we haven't done what we're supposed to do. The first of all prayer supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks we made for all men, especially for kings and supremes and those that are in rule and in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. For this is the will of God, our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You know, so he told us to pray. But if Christians aren't praying, and my people which are called by my name shall not humble themselves and pray, you know, if people get their eyes on men instead of on God and faith in God, they start putting their trust in President Trump and his policies and the Republican Party to do what's right, and they get their faith in that, then, you know, God can't bless that. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we, we're so... People don't realize... Christian people don't realize how easy it is to, 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 to turn toward idolatry and we don't even know we're doing it. When we, when we start exalting men, when we start exalting you know, political parties, when we start looking to them for answers instead of keeping our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in Him, then we have to be corrected. You know, we have to be careful. You know, David got in trouble in the Old Testament when he numbered Israel. He wasn't supposed to number Israel. But he wanted to take a human assessment of his armies because he had more faith in the number of his men and their abilities and the strength of their legs and the power of their horses. And God judged him because of that. I don't care how big your army is. If God's not fighting for you, you don't stand a chance. I mean, you, I, look, I was reading about the American Revolution last night. And, you know, there was, a, I believe it was the Battle of Princeton. And, and I believe it was Trenton. I can't remember. I think that was the two. And they were, it was, I mean, the, the British, they didn't think the American army could win that. I mean, they, had, they were arrogant and, and, and overconfident. And with the help and grace of God... President George Washington won those two battles, and they said if he wouldn't have won those two battles, that they would have lost the Revolutionary War. But because those two battles, God aided them and helped them, it increased the confidence and the zeal of the American forces, and they went on to win, after five years, went on to win the American Revolutionary War. And it, they, they were against all odds. So if you have God fighting for you, Abraham Lincoln said, I'm not so much concerned about whether uh, God is on my side, but whether I am on God's side, you know. And so we have to understand that in this, in this time, in this human, when we're living here in the earth, we are strangers and we are pilgrims here, and we have to depend on God. It's the same way with Abraham. Abraham had to do business in, in the promised land. He had to do business in that land with heathens. They were heathenistic. They were idol worshipers. Now Abraham had been called out of idol worship. You know, he, he had heard the voice of God and he went out into that promised land not troubling his mind. In other words, God spoke to him so plainly and so clearly that he had such conviction and such faith that he started out on a journey not knowing where he was going. That's the type of faith that Abraham operated in. And he had to do business with those people. And I really believe that God used him as a witness about the, the, the living God. I really do. I mean, they were, God blessed Abraham. But you know, we have to be careful. In our walk with God. See, Abraham was a type of a spiritual man. I mean, a justified man. He, he was the justified one. He, he was the first one that the Bible said he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. So we see Abraham as a justified man. And, and we see that Abraham, you know, he had some ups and downs and he wasn't perfect, you know. But he never wavered in his faith, you know, that the Lord was God. And so, being a justified man, he gave birth to Isaac, 
And we'll talk about Isaac a little bit later. But Isaac is a type of a spiritual man. You know, Isaac, he had a few problems. You know, he had, he had some trouble with, with famine, you know. And, and, and he had a, a, a trouble with, you know, Abimelech, one of the kings there. But for the most part, he had a very successful life. You know, and that's the way the justified man is supposed to be. The justified man is supposed to bring forth a spiritual man. That's what God wants. That's the plan of God is for you after you're born again and you become the righteousness of God that you become skillful in righteousness. You know, the Bible says that, that a person that is uh, immature is because they're they're unskillful in the word of righteousness, for they are obeyed. So a lot of people get born again, but because they don't really learn about righteousness and what it means to be in right standing with God, they remain babies. They, they, they operate in the elementary part of, of Christianity. You know, they, they, they want to stay on milk. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they want to stay on milk. You know, and milk... It, it is a soothing type food. You know, milk soothes you. It's easy to go down. And, and, it's, and it's cool and it's refreshing. But how many of you know that you can't live on milk forever? You know, you've got to graduate. It's a solid food. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. you got you got to graduate to solid food. And, you know, in the Word of God... We can't always hear things that are soothing. We, we can't always hear things that pacify us and that make us feel good. You know, and, and be um, what we call motivational speakers. We can't do that. We can't live there. You know, if you, you know they, they've proven that if you let a baby suck a bottle long enough, it'll rot its teeth out of its head. You know, you can't do that. You've got to graduate people. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to become skillful in righteousness so that we can become a spiritual person. So that we can do like Isaac did and let God bring things to us. I mean, God brought to Isaac inheritance. You know, he brought to Isaac prosperity. God brought to Isaac a wife. God brought success to Isaac. And Isaac had a, a peaceful life. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, like I did, and I'm guilty of it, they end up like Jacob. They, they don't give birth to, my justified man didn't give birth to a spiritual man. My, my, my justified man brought forth a soulish man. And I began to operate in the realm of feelings and, and self-will and, and depending on emotions. And, and, and my own ideas and ways of thinking. And so I, I, I slipped into an area of soul. See, God, our soul is part of our man, but our soul has to be redeemed. Our soul has to be restored. The Lord restores my soul. And I didn't know how to restore my soul. I didn't know how to grow up in Him and let God change my soul. So you know what happened? Like so many Christians... So many Christians, I made my, I made my, uh, I'm not trying to think of his name now. He was an Edomite. Esau. My soulish man, even though I was still justified, my soulish man made my Esau mad. And it stirred up my flesh. The word Esau means red. So me operating as a, as a baby Christian, not, not, not understanding righteousness, not understanding how to take advantage of grace through the cross and the blood of Christ, I was operating purely in Esau, in my flesh. So I had trouble, and I stayed on the run for years and years and decades. I stayed struggling with my soul. And there's so many people in the body of Christ that are doing the same thing. They have no peace. They have no lasting joy. They have no spiritual, spiritual growth. Because they're operating out of their soul. They're self-willed. They're not submitting themselves to the, to the work of the Holy Spirit. 
They're going about to establish their own righteousness and do things by works, by operating in the flesh. And they're not yielding their self to the spirit. They're not wanting to be the spiritual man that Isaac was. <clears throat> but you know, eventually you get tired of that. And then you begin, you become enslaved. And I became enslaved. And you know, I, uh, Jacob had a, a father-in-law that he worked for for years and decades and decades. <clears throat> and the father-in-law cheated him out of his wages. You know, so many Christians are being cheated out of their inheritance because they're not living the Isaac life. They're living the Jacob life. They're operating out of their soul and their self-will and they're not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God. Well, you say, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. But most people are saying, I got this, Lord. Thanks for saving me, though. But I got this now. You know? And, we, and, and, you know, the Bible says that Abraham obeyed God's voice and went out. And a lot of people are going their own direction and doing their own thing. You know? It, it just amazes me. People that, the people that won't obey God. You know, I talk to people all the time. And I bring this up a lot, and I know you probably get tired of hearing it. But I talk to people all the time that don't have a home church. And I'm like, you need to get in church. You need to, you need to join us. Well, I just haven't found that, that church yet. I'm like, well, I know God has a place for you. You know? It may not be that perfect place. I know one, one couple was telling me one time, said, I'm looking for a church that has all five-fold ministries in operation. And they're mature. And I said, well, you need to go then. You need to go there and, and share that wonderful maturity and perfection that you have. Maybe you can bring them up to your level. Let me tell you how to get up as serve. <laughs> you serve your way up in the kingdom of God. You humble yourself and you'll be exalted. You make yourself a servant of all. And then you're told to come sit up on the front row. You know what I'm saying? That's the way of the kingdom. But I get, I get amazed at people that are immature, that have no concept of righteousness or how to walk in victory. They're carnal, and they don't even realize how carnal they really are. And then yet, they don't obey God's word. They don't tithe. They don't, and somebody said, well, Brother Roger, you're talking about works. No, I'm talking about obedience. I'm not talking about working for something. I'm talking about obeying God. The Bible talks about the obedience of faith. Faith produces virtue. Faith produces obedience. True faith. You know, we have to be careful that we grow up and take our place. Grow up and take the place that God has for you. And quit being like Jacob. Quit being rude. Oh, I just, you know, people amaze me. Oh, they just made me mad. They, they offended me. They hurt my feelings. You know, they, they, they hadn't treated me right. They hadn't asked me to sing specials. You know, they hadn't invited me to preach. You know, they hadn't even been faithful. You know, they haven't come to practice. You know. It's the truth, you know, so, and, and they make it all, there's people that are self-willed and soulless, they make it all about them, all about me. You know, they hurt my feelings. They push my buttons. Well, get your buttons removed. Don't have any buttons for people to push. Amen. Grow up and walk in love and be like him, you know. I was, I was listening to a missionary the other night. He was talking about, he was, he was down on, the, on his knees crying out, God, please give me a nation. Give me a nation, Lord. Give me a nation. I want a nation. I want to preach the gospel. I want to be a missionary. Put it in the heart of my wife. Put it in the heart of my kids. Lord, I want you to give me a nation. And he said the Lord spoke to him. He said, oh, you really want a nation? He said, I knew I was being corrected right then. But you know what? When God's correcting us, we ought to be stand to attention and say, yes, Lord. Because he only corrects you because he loves you. That's what the Bible says. You know? And he said, the Lord said, 
You know why you're down there praying for a nation? He said, because you, you, you feel like your church doesn't appreciate you. All the sacrifices that you make, you're discouraged with them. You're disappointed with them. And he said, you know, you, you think they just use me like a spare tire. And uh, he said, I'm not saying they don't. But you're, you're offended at them because of the, their walk with me. And he said, so you feel like if you went off to a third world country somewhere, they would appreciate your ministry, your love, and your dedication. And he said, and I would bless you, and I would honor my word, and I'd give you, you know, I would come confirm the word with signs following. And, and you would think, see that? I can do it here. But because of their spiritual condition, I couldn't do it there because it's their fault. And he said, you know what? And I love this, this quote. Everything has children. Everything has children. If you're discouraged, your discouragement will have children. If you're disappointed, your disappointment will have children. He said, now my son lived his life, gave his life to people that hated him and despised him. When you can do that, I'll send you to another country. When it's not about you, but it's about them. Well, that just really, that tore my heart in two. I was like, wow. You know, when, whenever we, 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 we want to step out of that place, you know, and, and Jacob became so miserable. I mean, he, he got tired of it. He got tired of being cheated. He got tired of not possessing his inheritance. He got tired of being away from his family. And you know what he did? He got his stuff together and he left in the middle of the night. And he started on his way home. And his father-in-law was right behind him trying to catch up with him. The Bible says that when he got close to the promised land, that the Lord appeared to him. And there was a wrestling match. How many of you ever wrestled with God before? Nobody here? I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about how many of you ever struggled with God? You contended with God. He did. Jacob contended with God. And when you get fed up enough with the soulish, childish, selfish way, then God will meet you. And he won't give up on you. He won't quit. And Abel, I mean, Jacob wouldn't quit. He was determined for change. You know? And that's the way we need to be. If you find yourself in that spiritual state, you know, Peter talked about it. He said, don't, don't, don't give in to fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You know, there are things that are not good for your soul. The Bible says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Paul said that we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be renewed in, the, in your mind. Receive the renewing of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind in one other place he talks about. When you want to grow, you go to the word of God. And you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth and graft that truth into your life. To where you change the way you're thinking. You tell the Father you want to grow up. I will hear your voice. I will obey you. I want to enter into the promised land. Jacob crossed over that river. But he did something happen before he crossed over that river. The Bible says that he wrestled with God. And it says the Lord told him after he, he prevailed, the Bible says. 
He prevailed in the struggle. He stayed in the presence of God. He stayed there until he was transformed. God said, you're no longer going to be called Jacob. But your name shall be called Israel. For you have power with God and with men. And Jacob, he got it in order. He became the prince that he was supposed to be. Instead of the servant. You know, many people find themselves in that situation. They find themselves in a strange, as strangers and pilgrims. And many of them act like the people of the land. But God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to come out and to be different. Things changed for Jacob after that. There was peace with his flesh. He made peace with Esau. You know, you're not always supposed to be fighting your flesh. You know, I used to do that all the time. I'd rebuke the flesh, you know, talk to the flesh all the time. <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, and evil desires do rise up in your physical body, especially when you don't have things in divine order. Where you understand what just justification means and sanctification means, where you can walk in peace. Follow after those things, you know, the Bible says, which make for peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, so when you understand righteousness, you know, in the biblical sense and in the Testament sense, then it produces righteousness has its fruit, the Bible says, in the book of Romans in the sixth chapter. Righteousness has a fruit which is holiness. When you understand righteousness, then it affects you and you, you walk in sanctification. And that's what God wants people to do. Now, we have the ability now, since we have understanding, and I haven't always had that understanding, where we can help people get saved and come to know the Lord and then teach them about righteousness and help them to avert going in the way of Jacob and stay in the way of Isaac. So they can learn by example, and they don't have to learn by pain and suffering like I did and failure. So they don't waste years of their life not understanding the principles of righteousness. I think I pretty well covered that part. But you know, I love that teaching. It's just so wonderful. Understanding the difference between the justified man, the spiritual man, the soulish man, and the flesh. You know, I marvel at... at at Abraham. You know, I don't really exactly know what Abraham saw or exactly what God told Abraham because it does, it's not clear. You know, it doesn't go, but Jesus said he saw my day. So God showed Abraham something in the future and not only him, but he passed it on to uh, Isaac and Jacob and not only him, but Joseph also. But God showed him something so clearly that, a that Abraham was willing to follow what God had to say no matter what. You know, the Bible says in the book, of, it, it, later on in this chapter, you know, it talks about uh, even Sarah received strength to conceive seed. You know, if you go back in the book of Genesis, you'll see that, that she doubted God. But if you'll notice the way God narrates it after she repented, then there's no mention of that. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that you can waver and you can doubt and after you repent that it's not even remembered in heaven? When you stand before him, that will never be brought to account. Only, only mercy and forgiveness, all that will be blotted out. And so your, your walk of faith will be recounted and remembered in heaven. Let's read on down now. I think we pretty well covered that. I'm back in for, uh, chapter 10 now. Let's see.
I don't know exactly what, what verse it starts at, but it says, For he was constantly waiting for and expecting the city, having the foundations, the architect and builder of which is God. See, these people walked. They walked with their eyes not on this world. They had their eyes on another world. Another age, I would say. They were looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. You know, we have to be, we have to be careful We have to be very careful about our successes here in earth. I heard one minister that I respect a lot, he said, success is more dangerous than failure in this world. You know, you just look around you at the people who enter into the realm of Hollywood, who are Christian singers. You know, I was I was listening to uh, uh, Brother Robin Bullock the other day, and he was talking about people that Christian people that entered into the realm of politics and have now been corrupted because of power, because of money. You know, we need to keep in perspective that this is just a temporary place, and we don't need to be adulterated in our thoughts and especially in our hearts about. You know, the enduring substance of this world because it's not going to last. I look at people on TV sometimes and, and they're older than me and I see them, you know, and I know how close I am now. I'm a whole lot more behind me than I have in front of me. And I see these people, how they operate and how they think. And I'm like, you think you're going to live forever, don't you? you? You got it in your mind that you're not going to die. You know, you think about death sometimes. But you don't really think you're going to die. Why? The Bible says that God has put eternity in man's heart. That's what it says in the book of Job. So people really never think they're going to die. They always think they're going to live another day, another day, another day, one more day, one more day. And guess what? They're not. The curtain's going to come down on the plate one day. I can promise you that. And it may come sooner than you think. So don't set your heart on things here on the earth. The Bible says set your heart on things above. And that doesn't mean you don't plan. I got tickled at somebody on Facebook the other day. They were like, if you could go back and tell your 18-year-old self three words, what would they be? What would they be, John? Three words. When you're 18. Boy, mine came, mine came real quick. Don't get married. <laughs> Don't get married. <laughs> I saw my ex-wife said, save my money. <laughs> you know, this is, I'm not saying we shouldn't save. I'm not saying we shouldn't plan. Because, you know, the Bible talks about that. The ant, you know. And, and it's okay. To, it's okay to plan. It's okay. It's all right. But don't put all your stock here. You know the Bible talks about barns, wine presses. It talks about those kind of things. But don't put all your faith. Don't put your faith in a bank account. Don't put your faith in your cattle or your horses or your smarts. Or you're planning, trust in the Lord, the Bible says. Commit your way to Him. What did Jesus say, thou fool, this night? Thy soul shall be required of thee. Better to have you trust in the Lord. The Bible says righteousness saves you. So don't put all your stock in, 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 in the stock market. You know, people, people put their trust in money. They put their, their trust in success. They, they put their trust in their houses. They put their trust in their, in their abilities. But I've seen people, I've seen people lose millions of dollars just like you snap your finger. I've seen people completely devastated. 
I've seen people lose their health. I've seen people have strokes. I've seen people have heart attacks. I'm talking about people that work for 40 years to build an empire and then boom. Don't, don't set your affections on things below. Keep your priorities straight. You remember whenever the, the city of Sodom, the, the king of Sodom came out and Abraham had, had went out and by the help and grace of God got his family back. And, and the king of Sodom met him and said, keep the stuff. Just give me the people. Well, see, the king understood the productivity of the city was in the people. He said, go ahead and take the stuff. And Abraham said, I will not take a shoestring from you, lest you said you made Abraham rich. I don't know too many people that would have done that. You know, I've had people approach me before. And make me an offer on some unethical business ventures. And I'm talking about, you know, half a million dollars. And I, I was like, I can't do that. I, I just can't do that. You know? I, I've never, you know, I, I just, whenever you, whenever you do an unprincipled thing, you know, you have no hedge of protection against you. I mean, for in your in, in your case, you, you just don't have any edge protection. So we need to make sure that as long as we're in this world, that we don't love this world. We don't fall in love with this world system. You know, I had somebody come up to me the other day, and they're like, "Well, I sure wish we didn't have to fool with money. I wish money was no issue." I was like, "You and seven billion other people around the world." It just, and it's filthy lucre. It's dog eat dog, man. That's why we have to depend on the Lord. You know, and trust in Him. It's so important that we live as strangers and pilgrims, knowing that it's temporary, it's short lived. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be wise, man. We should be wise as serpents, the Bible says. We should operate in wisdom, discretion. We should operate in, in insight. We should care. I, I get amazed at people. You know, I, I don't know why I'm harping on money, but I get amazed at people who don't value the money that God places in their hands. The blessing of the Lord I'm talking about. The sanctified riches that come to His people. I'm amazed. People, people don't have any control. Christian people don't have any control of their passions. They don't have any control of their, their money. Their money controls them. They love to spend because it produces a, the feeling of euphoria. Makes them feel important. See, you're operating from the soul. You're operating from the soul. You know, start operating from your heart. Stop, start operating on the principles of the Word of God. Keep covetous out of yourself and don't be a waster. Because God, look, let me tell you something. If God holds you accountable for every word that comes out of your mouth, every word, He, you're going to give an account. How much more is He going to hold you accountable for? On the way you handle your money. Are you a servant to your money or is your money a servant to you? Is it a tool or is it a hindrance? I know people that borrow money from me and God knows. I don't make a lot of money. And I'm not just saying that. I'm saying I'm in the position of life I'm in now doing what I'm doing. I don't make a whole lot of money. And these people that make five, six, seven, ten times more money than I do come to me and borrow money at times. And that's not to put a feather in my cap. I just learned through decades, you know, of, of the wisdom of God. I'm running out of time. You know what Jesus said? This is the litmus test for me. If I'm talking to somebody and I had somebody call me last week and wanted to borrow some money. 
No, they wanted me to give them some money. I think of that. I said, you know, I said, it's funny. Every time I roll my change up, I get a phone call from you. Either you are prophetic or you have a good sense of smell. I said, last time I had $200 worth of quarters, nickels, and dimes, and, and, and right when I got them rolled up, I got a phone call. Hey, we, we need some help. I said, man, you make 10 times more money than I do. Jesus said, what did Jesus say? He that is unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you true riches? I know people right now who have a desire to go into the ministry. And they can't manage their money. If you think Jesus is going to entrust to that person a ministry, they're fooling their self. You've got to get over oh, See, it gets real quiet in church when I talk about it. Money, kids, marriage. And I'm not going to talk about marriage because I'm not an authority yet. <laughs> the world, they, they, they infuse success with righteousness. The world does. You know, um, money is the closest thing to a man's heart. Unless he really knows God. Women too. I'm not just I'm not just talking about males, I'm talking about men. Mankind. Beware of covetousness. Boy, I tell you what. I have seen it in my own family. I have seen people act in ways that I didn't even know they could act. I didn't know they could do a war dance. Have you ever seen anybody do a war dance? I've seen people actually dance. They get so mad that they stomp around the room if they think they're not being treated right when it comes to money. Can I give you one word of advice? I just talked to somebody in my family. Their husband died without them having a will. Don't do that. Don't do that. Dot your I's and cross your T's is all I got to tell you. Take care of business. If you want to give something to the church, ask Brother Allen. Dot your eyes and cross your teeth, come brother out. I gotta quit. John Peters, I got fifty of John Peters. He had a man that, that, that gave him a checkbook, and I, I don't know if I've ever told this story or not, but a man gave a checkbook to Brother John, said, Here it is. Whatever you want to write, it don't matter. You, you fill the check out, and the Lord said no, because you'll trust in that checkbook rather than me. So John gave him the checkbook back. I don't know too many ministers that would do that either. That's right. I admired him. I respected him when, when he told me that. But on that man's deathbed, told his wife, he said, write John a check for $100,000. Next day, John was back in there, man praying with the man. Man asked John to come. The man asked his wife, said, did you give John the money? No. He said, that man became very angry. And he wanted it. John had the money. Well, he died that day. And guess what? John never got that money. Didn't honor the man of God. You know, he wasn't going to keep it for himself. He was going to put it in the ministry. But whatever you want done, make sure you have a testament. Make sure you have a will. You know, we need to, you know, your money is valuable. It takes your precious time that can never be redeemed, really. And God expects if you if you contribute that to receive monetary, you know, assets and funds, then he expects you to honor that. Honor him with it, but also honor the value of it and the time it's spent and don't treat it 
frivolously, get that out. Okay, I gotta quit. Gotta quit right in the middle of it. I appreciate your attention. Thank you and God bless you.